morning. Good afternoon, everybody. We've got a truly like international audience today across Canada and the United States. I think the biggest group of states and provinces and diversity wise we've had in a very long time. So welcome into the program. If you are new to us at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure and science into classrooms around the world. And it is so thrilling to have you back. I know for some of you, it's your first program back after March break. For some of you, it's your first program with us generally, in which case, welcome to the broadcast. I was just saying to our StreamYard classes, we've got about 60 programs coming up in April. It's going to be absolutely bonkers. I hope you guys take the chance to check out our website, explore all we have to offer, and everything we do stays on YouTube forever. So you can check out this program, everything we do on our YouTube channel when you're done. Now, without further ado, I'm going to welcome in Sheila Atchison in a minute, and she is with Fisheries and Oceans Canada. We have been doing an incredible series of them over the last few weeks, highlighting some of their incredible stories of adventure, science, exploration, coast to coast to coast across my home, Canada. We have a lot of Americans today, so we've got some pretty cool stuff going on up here. And particularly, Sheila's going to talk to us today about the weird and wonderful life of Canadian Arctic wildlife. The Arctic is one of the biggest, most unexplored and amazing regions on this planet. We're really lucky to have it right in our backyard here in Canada. And Sheila is going to be a little bit of a guide for us today, highlighting some of the amazing work that she gets to do exploring and understanding. So without further ado, Sheila, welcome to the broadcast for the very first time. It's so nice to have you here. <laughs> Hello. Hello. I know you've got a lot to share with us, so feel free to dive in with the presentation. We'll get underway, and I can't wait for all our questions uh, when we're when we're wrapped. Awesome. Great. Fantastic. All right. I'm going to share my screen here. Let's just see. Wants to work. No spoilers. There we go. No spoilers. <laughs> You're all good right. to go. <laughs> okay. So who am I? Um, I'm an aquatic biologist with Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And uh, just before I get into the whole presentation, I just want to acknowledge that I am on Treaty 1 territory, um, the territories of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Dakota, Dene, uh, Métis, and Oji Cree nations, and homeland of the Red River Métis. Uh, and a lot of my work takes, across, uh, takes place across Inuit Nunangat, uh, homeland of the Inuit peoples in Canada. Um, so yes, I'm Jill Atchison. I work for Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And how did I get here to Arctic science? Um, because this is a presentation for schools, I wanted to just give a brief background on my education. And of course, uh, most times when you hear a story, it starts at the beginning and it ends at the end. And it seems very direct. You go to elementary school, high school, you have jobs, you go to secondary school, college or university or whatever, um, and you end up in the place you end up. Um, and some people know exactly where they're going from the start, and that's fantastic. I didn't necessarily. My path looked a little more like this, and I was very lucky to be able to uh, change my mind and do a couple of different things during my path. Um, so I did go to high school and elementary school and everything, and I had some jobs. I worked in bakeries and grocery stores. I got a university degree. Um, and I actually was fortunate to switch my major from forest ecology into a uh, biology honors degree. So um, I, you don't always end up where you start out. Um, I got lots of very interesting summer jobs during my university degree. Uh, this is an airboat. I worked in a lot of freshwater marshes um, doing water sampling, actually, uh, very far from Arctic science. And during my degree and all the work I did, I did get a chance to take some time off to travel um, and do volunteering and extra training. And uh, here's, here's a monkey I saw when I was traveling. Um, but I did a lot of volunteering, um, things like owl banding, things not necessarily directly related to Arctic marine science, uh, but all of that different experience gave me um, the foundation with which to end up where I am. Um, so I'm really lucky with my job. I get to uh, travel a lot with it. And all these little red stars here are places that I've gotten to travel to uh, with work. Um, you can see I've been to the US uh, up in Alaska with work. I got to fish in the Alaskan Beaufort Sea. And uh, yeah, I've been to Alert, which is the highest uh, inhabited place in, in the world. I think that's pretty cool. Um, and so the majority of the critters and the, and the work I'm going to show you today um, come from the Canadian Beaufort Sea here. 
and from uh, Baffin Bay and Davis Strait, so this uh, sort of uh, Western and Eastern Canadian Arctic. Um, I also get to live on ships when I do my work. Um, I've also gotten to go to ice camps and do a lot of uh, remote field station work. Um, so I, I regularly travel on interesting um, uh, vessels. I've lived on five different research vessels and uh, got to use a lot of different equipment. Um, everything like I showed you in airboat before, that was really cool. Things like snowmobiles. And um, I've got a quick video now of one of the small planes that we took up in the uh, Western Arctic uh, flying over our research vessel. It's, it's only 11 seconds long, but I think it's a pretty fun clip. <laughs> So that was the frosty that uh, the pilot decided to buzz kind of last minute. Um, this is a research vessel, uh, Terrajok. Uh, she is docked in Nuuk, Greenland. And uh, over on the Eastern Arctic, um, we do co-manage a lot of stocks of fish and shrimp uh, with Greenland. So we're able to use their research vessel, the Terrajok. And that's the one that I'm primarily on right now. Um, life on a vessel begins with safety. Uh, we always put safety first. Uh, you can get into some sticky situations quickly when you're pretty isolated like that. So um, I've got a quick video now of some storms that we saw. And uh, I think, I don't know, I think it's pretty entertaining because we still have to live and, and uh, eat and shower, even if we're uh, living in something that is being tossed around by the ocean. You're not necessarily unsafe, but it is not easy to live in those conditions when, when a storm is kicked up. So I'm just gonna show you a quick video of a storm at sea. Oh, no, I'm not. Hang on here. Let me go back. <laughs> oh, oh, it'll work, Sean. Uh, these things have to happen. There we go. <laughs> yeah, me. That's uh, that's what it can look like when your house is getting tossed about. Again, we weren't unsafe there, but it's uh, it's an interesting challenge. Um, the accommodations on some of the vessels are are wonderful. Uh, we get bunks and uh, baths. Um, the there is uh, meals provided for us with wonderful food. Some boats even have a gym, which we never have time to use, but there's always good intentions. And some of the very interesting equipment we use to uh, sample uh, the critters, which I will get to very shortly, but I want to show you some of this very cool equipment because I think it's uh, fantastic. Um, the equipment that we use uh, varies depending on what part of the ecosystem we want to uh, uh, sample. So we've got things like this is a rosette water sampler up in the top corner here. And uh, it samples the water and it'll measure things like nutrients and algae. Um, this thing here is a box core. It'll collect mud from the bottom and all of the super interesting invertebrates that live right on top of the mud and then also in the mud. So epifauna and infauna. Um, we have uh, nets that look like bongo drums um, uh, for sampling zooplankton and uh, out of the water column. And of course we have the fishing nets. So we've got a lot of different pieces of equipment to get all the pieces of the ecosystem to sample. And uh, I have another video, I think this one's only around a minute long, of some of the equipment we use while we're up there. 
this then this particular video, just so uh, I can say it, is uh, this takes place in the Beaufort Sea. <laughs> some of the very interesting equipment. As I mentioned, there's the bongo nets up here, uh, multi-samplers. We've got some CTDs, which measure um, salinity, temperature, and depth. And here's the caught end of one of our bigger fishing nets pulling up some redfish. Um, the main thing that I focus on is the fishing. Uh, so I will be talking more about that. And here, again, is some of the fishing nets that we use. And uh, you just saw some nice videos of what it's like during the data sample, but here's a, again, a quick video of uh, what it looks like to sample in the middle of the night. Um, <clears throat> in uh, This is in the Eastern Arctic, so Baffin Bay, Davis Strait. And this is, this is closer to what I'm doing right now. Oops, again, it happened again, that's okay. I know how to fix this now. more like what my shifts look like. Um, now that we've got all the stuff from the caught end, uh, what do we do with all these critters that come on board? So onto the critters. Um, well, the first thing we do is we sort them. Uh, we sort and identify them as much as we can to their different taxa, to the species or families. Uh, we weigh everything and we count. Um, if we have time, uh, we'll take subsamples of things. So we might take uh, otoliths, which are the ear bones of fish, which we can use to age the fish. Um, we will sometimes take stomach samples so we can uh, see what they were eating. Um, and this is of course on the dead fish. Um, many fish do make it out alive and we try to get them back in the water as quickly as possible, especially if they're a, uh, um, a species of concern. Um, and uh, let's see here. We one of the species that we focus this the um, assessment efforts on uh, is Greenland halibut, and we get to catch them when they're tiny little babies. These translucent things up here, all the way up to these enormous fish that are almost as long as I am, and I think that's really cool. Um, here are some other very interesting fish that we catch uh, fairly regularly. Uh, this is a spiny lump sucker. We've got a lanternfish, Arctic and polar cod, which are keystone species in the Arctic um, ecosystem. They're, I call them the Snickers bars of the seas. I don't know if that's entirely accurate, but um, just about everything eats them and they eat all the smaller things. So they're, they're very important in moving energy through the ecosystem. Here we've got a sea tadpole which uh, is as gooey as it looks. And this is called a fish doctor, this long orange guy here. Uh, we've got some gelatinous sea snails, which yes, they're as slimy as they look. 
um, a three beard rockling up at the top here. Uh, this is a very interesting, I think, uh, eel pout. Um, you can talk about exploring. Uh, we found this eel pout uh, fishing uh, in the Beaufort Sea where no one had ever fished before. We just, we cast our nets down um, to see what we would bring up and we didn't really realize that the eel pouts got this big in the Canadian Arctic. So it was a kind of a surprise when we brought them on board. Uh, here we have a little skate, a thorny skate. Uh, this is a lump fish and they're beautiful teal green color. Uh, I think they're gorgeous. And uh, redfish, these are little baby redfish and they'll grow up to be much bigger. This is a cool fish. Uh, so this is a chimera and uh, this is the head on shot of it. So it's it's got a very interesting um, anatomy. <laughs> and uh, this down here is a, uh, again, an eel pouch, but just slightly smaller than the one I just showed you. And uh, some of my favorite sort of, I call them deep sea, um, deep sea fangly fish or deep sea toothy fish, but uh, they have proper scientific names. Um, we've got a northern cutthroat eel, a uh, rough-nosed grenadier here. This is a dragonfish or viperfish, depending on who you ask. And up in the top corner here is an ogrefish. It, all of these fish are actually quite small, but um, they've got a lot of uh, uh, teeth on them, so they look intimidating. And over to uh, some little skates here. I think, again, these are thorny skates. Um, we've got a tiny little um, cephalopod down here. And uh, over here is a, um, this is a parasite that lives on some of the fish. So sometimes we see these things sticking out of the fish and uh, uh, yeah, it's kind of, I don't know, it's gross, but interesting. Um, and here's a sea spider. Uh, the uh, Pictogonad is the family, but they're, um, they get pretty big actually. I'm always impressed with how big the sea spiders get. Uh, this on top here is a basket star, um, which is related to um, uh, sea stars. Um, and I just think they're beautiful. We have an armored um, shrimp over here. This is a pandalid shrimp. These are actually quite tasty. Uh, a spiny crab and a zooplankton here. So remember I said earlier about those fish that eat all the, uh, the small things. This is where it all starts, the, the zooplankton. Um, eat, are eaten by those Arctic cod and they move the energy from the zooplankton up through the, uh, the ecosystem to the larger fish and mammals. So here we have some more invertebrates, a sea star, some more sea spiders right on the side here. There's one, two, three different ones here. Um, and then two, two other sea stars. There's a lot of different variety. <clears throat> the Arctic has um, a high degree of variety in it uh, as far as the taxonomy of the fish and the invertebrates goes. And uh, there's even, there's corals, there's kelp beds, there's things that you wouldn't expect to be in so far north in, in such cold waters, but they all are there. Um, just maybe a little bit less diverse than, uh, than a tropical sort of area, but nonetheless, um, Highly interesting. We've got some worms here, um, some euphosids, another type of armored shrimp, tiny little crab. And I have a, I think it's my last video of some critters. Oh, no, it's my second last video. I have two more videos and then I will open up the floor to questions. But uh, yeah, this is a video just a minute long and uh, it's some of the critters that we've come across again in the Canadian Beaufort Sea. Thank you. 
And um, I mentioned earlier the mammals. Uh, we do encounter different uh, non-sea wildlife and, and sea wildlife. So there, obviously there's, uh, there's whales and seals. Um, they love coming up to our boat and seeing if they can get food from us. Uh, the polar bears are very curious, but they do tend to stay back. Um, and uh, this, this picture here is of a wolf that was coming through uh, one of our camps uh, up in uh, Alert. And I wasn't here for this, but um, I, I had already gone home from camp when this happened. But apparently this wolf, or one of his buddies, uh, walked into our camp one day and uh, peed on one of our computers that was logged in data, and then just walked away. So there's always interesting wildlife encounters in the north. Um, I do have another brief video of some whales. Again, they come up to our ships and uh, they can smell the fish that we're bringing on board and they would love a tasty bite. And I think sometimes they do manage to get some, but uh, not 100% sure on that. So uh, these are northern bottlenose whales. But... And uh, I just maybe want to give you a brief why about why we do all this work. I mean, I think it's super fun, but it's also got a purpose. Um, so first and foremost, our work supports uh, the fisheries and the ecosystems that people rely on. So people living in the communities in the north uh, rely on healthy ecosystems for food security. Um, there are grocery stores, but it's not always easy to get fresh, healthy food. Um, and the food can be quite expensive, uh, so country food is extremely important. Um, and there's also the livelihoods of people who fish uh, for, for some of these species for a living. Um, so we provide for them the, uh, the best available scientific uh, advice that we can. Um, that's what we're there to do, is, is try to give them information that will help them and, and will help uh, everybody in the ecosystem as well. Um, so we do take... Uh, sort of all of these measurements of oceanography and water chemistry, I specialize in the fish, um, but there's a lot of different um, disciplines that I work with. And uh, I'll just acknowledge right now that oh, many of the pictures uh, in this presentation weren't even my pictures. Uh, they're from my colleagues. We, we do everything as a team. Um, so we, uh, we all work together to build uh, information on um, parts of the ecosystem, uh, you know, the ages, the the, uh, the structures of different populations, who's eating whom, so the trophic ecology, um, so that we can inform uh, the health of the people or that rely on, on the ecosystem for food security. And we can, we can give our data and information to management um, so that they can make decisions. Um, we can measure changes over time and we can provide, again, information to support the ecosystem approach to fisheries management and support conservation in marine protected areas. Um, we try to piece together the bits of the ecosystem um, so that uh, we, can, we can help keep uh, ecosystems as healthy and, and, and provide information for conservation. Um, so yes, uh, I think that concludes my presentation. Uh, thanks for hanging out with me, guys. I would love to take your questions. I, I think we're 
Uh, we got tons of time for questions, Sheila. You killed it. That was fantastic. And by the way, I'm sure you'll be pleased to know that the one comment on the chat the whole time was that students loved your music. So thank you for adding <laughs> that to the thing. Fantastic. Yes. Um, we are going to dive in. We've got a ton of time for questions. YouTubers, you guys have been oddly quiet. If you want to share questions in the chat, please do. We'd love to hear from you guys. You can also email me if you're having any trouble with the chat. I know our YouTube has been a little wonky lately. Um, I am going to go to our live classes in just a second. Um, Ms. Gallup's class, if you guys want to unmute your mics and kick us off, um, uh, they're in Guelph. You are good to go to kick us off with our, our first one. Hi, grade fives. Hi. Hello. Caitlin, come on over. Come on, Caitlin. <laughs> we have a question. Um, Caitlin wants me to ask it about um, if the fish that were that you were showing us, were they caught in the nets that you showed us too? Or how does the net match the type of, of ocean critter? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so we do catch everything in the trawl nets that I was showing you. Uh, I'm just scrolling up to a picture here. Um, so yeah, these, these nets are the ones that we pull the fish out of. Great. And Note that your screen's not sharing anymore. You oh. didn't get out of that. So if you want to bring it up, you can. Um, sure. Let me know. Yeah. While you're doing that, actually, I'll just note uh, our other classes. You guys can unmute your mics. Ms. Weezer's class, if you guys want to unmute and turn on your camera too, I'll be able to come to you guys pretty soon. Uh, but Sheila, take your time with the... The net we'd love to see it. There we go. <laughs> Get this straight here. Okay. So yes, there we are. These Perfect. nets that are the vast majority of how we pull up the um fish and invertebrates. Cool. Thanks, guys. This gallons class. Great first question. Um, you can either leave that screen share up or turn it off. Sometimes we get questions that require showing a picture, but you can absolutely if you can't see us, better to have the screen share off so you can see us and more fun that way. Um, Miss Cottrell's class, I'm gonna head to Baldwinsville, New York. If you guys have a query for us, and I bet you do, come on in. Hey guys. Yes, the impact of global warming on Arctic ecosystems and how can we help? My favorite question very fast. Way Absolutely. to go. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Oh, boy, it's uh, that's a big question. Thank you very much for it. Um, there are many impacts and i think the arctic is being impacted uh the fastest with global warming uh, small amounts of warming in the arctic translate to very very big changes i mean the biggest thing that we can do as individuals uh, are the the small things you know recycling and all that sort of stuff but also um putting pressure on uh pol politicians and corporations you know we can become citizen activists we can write to our politicians and say this is important to me um, it doesn't have to be big, but it but small pressures like that do make a difference. Yeah, it's something we've actually been coming to quite a bit this week, and I'm really glad when people highlight this because I think Sheila, uh, everybody tuned to my generation would be the one that would be like leading the charge things, and we sort of dropped the ball a little bit. But kids that are under 16, you guys march in like groups of like a million kids, and you've led to absolutely major world changes in the last decade. It's unbelievable. So it sounds small, writing, uh, lending your voice, but it makes a really big difference. And yeah. Frankly, you know, it, it can be distressing talking about climate change because a lot is changing very quickly and it's not particularly good. But there's been so much radical positive change in the last few decades that's astonishing that we are really working towards that. And I think a lot of people now, certainly your entire generation, knows the facts, are on board and are doing things to make a big difference. So it is the biggest question, Sheila, but I'm really glad we got it early in the program today. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Nice. Uh, we're getting some great questions from YouTube now, so I will come to you guys in a second. Miss Tarvin's class, I'm going to head to you guys live first, joining us in Canton, in Illinois. Come on in and take us away. Hey, guys. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> when you pluck out the guts from the fish, and once you're all done with them, what do you do with them? Yeah. Very good question. Yeah. Uh, we take the guts back to the lab, and we pull... Uh, whatever's in them out. Uh, again, we identify it as best we can, kind of chewed up sometimes, so it's hard to tell. Uh, we weigh it and we count it and we use that information to try to inform who's eating whom and how much are they eating. Yep. I really like that I work in a field where the phrase pluck out guts can come up in random conversations. So thank you for that, Ms. Tarvin student. Um, we're going to head to Riverside Consolidated, heading to New Brunswick, three through five. Welcome in, guys. Uh, and if you have a question for us, you're welcome to come on up. Hey. Uh, what happens when someone falls off the uh, boat and when it's the middle of the night? That yeah. sounds like a bad scenario. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, no one's done that when I've been at sea, um, but the crew does regularly practice uh, drills. So kind of like fire drills at school, 
uh, an alarm will go off. The captain knows it's just a drill, but the rest of the crew has to scramble and get to their stations and practice a man overboard. And then the captain will do um, a, an appropriate turn to turn the ship around and practice uh, a man overboard uh, rescue. Um, so no one's ever fallen off the ship while I've been on board. And I'm grateful for that because the water is very cold. It's something that we get a lot of uh, when we talk about deep sea expeditions, space expeditions, Arctic, Antarctica. Yeah. There's so much work to done done to prepare for contingencies like that, to make sure that if that situation ever does arise, yeah. that people can be rescued as quickly as possible and to hopefully never have it where that situation happens at all. But I'm really glad we get questions like that. So thanks, guys. Uh, Hila, we're going to head to YouTube for a minute. We are like whipping through these. You're the fastest Q&A person in a while. Um, Miss Boxall's class wants to know, no pressure at all. How many kinds of fish are there in the Arctic? <laughs> oh, I actually have the textbook right here, but Did I really she yes. didn't get the answer. <laughs> uh, I have something up on uh, Google as well, if it helps. But um, yeah. have no I, I don't know it off the top of my head, and I probably should. Uh, sorry, guys. But um... uh, dun, 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 dun. no, you're doing great. <laughs> I, I always like the superlative questions, so I appreciate this, guys. Yeah. And Lethbridge, Lethbridge, we're coming to you guys live next, but unmute your mic and I'll come in uh, for Soliana uh, and she can ask a person to begin, okay? Um, perfect. Okay, Sheila, I'll keep looking this up while you, oh, while no, you she, guys... Yeah, for, for what it's worth, Sheila, so NOAA, um, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, mentions 240, which seems unusually okay. low, actually, yeah. but that's interesting. And I, I think one of the things we always like to highlight with deep sea, with Arctic, are these are purely unexplored places. So every time we go and we look in serious scientific expeditions, we find new things. It's very cool for students. If you end up doing Sheila's job in your future, you almost certainly will have a situation where you get the chance to see or identify new species to science. So very cool. Oh, yeah. And there's always new, especially with the invertebrates. It's always changing. Um, it, it's actually kind of a... Uh, an, a problem. We we have to work on taxonomy constantly. You, you think it's set in stone, but it's it's not. So there's always new things coming up. Remind me of that when we're done the broadcast. It's just us. I've got a story for you. Um, I'm going to head to Miss Collins' class on YouTube, and then I'm going to do a Miss um, Weecher's class. I'll come to you guys in just a sec, too. There's so many questions. This is great. Miss Collins' class wants to know, interesting question. We've never had this one before. Are the decks of the ship heated to reduce ice buildup? How do you not slip? That's, that's a great question. Uh, they are not heated. <laughs> They're very cold. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the slipping is actually a problem. Um, we just, the scientists aren't allowed outside when it's uh, particularly slippery because the crew doesn't want to have to rescue us. Um, that's the answer. Is, and, it, and if there is ice buildup, the crew will go outside and chip the ice off the ship. But they don't, they don't let us out when it's... I bet they, the, the next gen ships will have some heated floors to accommodate Gen Z because that sounds yeah. pretty fun. That's, that's <laughs> great question, guys. Um, Lethbridge, I will just take your question from thing, but if you ever wanted to unmute your mic, I'd love to come to you in person. Uh, but Soliana wants to know if you've ever seen a shark, and this relates to a YouTube question too. Have you ever worked with sharks? Have you ever processed a shark? Any shark stuff for us? Uh, I have a little bit of experience with sharks. Uh, in the Arctic, there's uh, Greenland sharks. Um, and there's smaller sharks, uh, elasmobranchs like uh, dogfish. Um, my colleague Kevin Hedges actually works with Greenland sharks and handles them and tags them uh, directly. So he would be the expert in that. But yes, I've seen them. I've caught some of them. And especially Greenland sharks are particularly cool. So I do. They're really cool. cool. Yeah. They are such a unique and fantastical creature, many hundreds of years old. Yeah. Uh, Sheila, we've got time for a whole other round of questions and maybe more. So YouTubers, please keep sharing. I'm going to head to Miss Beth Gallant's class again. Uh, come on in, unmute your mic, and take us away. Hey, great thoughts. Well, unmute, unmute for us. <laughs> Perfect. Just getting my student over here. I'll take your time, too. Hi. How many storms? How many boats has she been on? In total? Oh, how many boats have you been on, Sheila? Okay, I actually have the number for that. I have five. I've been on five different recent vessels. Okay, and so compare and contrast for me here. Like the smallest one, how many people versus the big one? Are you in any like ocean liners, like Titanic type deal or, or what? No, nothing nothing terribly big. Um, uh, the smallest one I've been on uh, holds a dear, dear place in my heart. But when I was on it, I think there was 15 or 16 of us and there were two bathrooms. Nice. Um, <laughs> and uh, and probably the biggest one I've been on, uh, 
is the Terra Jock, and uh, she's um, she's got uh, private bathrooms for every room. So a little contrast. Right? It's almost got heated floors. It um, actually has heated floors in the bathroom. Hey, look at that! I love it's it. Uh, we've come full circle. It's been, it's been a beautiful yeah. program. Uh, Miss Contrell's class, we're going to head back to Baldwinville. Come on in and uh, go for it, guys. Hi. Hi, my name is Adriana, and my question is, what's the cutest creature you ever caught? Thanks, Adriana. Cutest creature. No pressure. Oh, my gosh. Uh, so, Adriana, I think all of the creatures that come out of the uh, cod end are cool. Every cod end opening is like Christmas morning. I just can't wait to see all of the, all of the things coming out of it. And the, the cod end, by the way, is, is the... Uh, the end of the net where the fish come out of, just, just so we're clear. Um, but there's one fish in particular, the Atlantic spiny lump sucker, um, that I really think is probably the cutest. That was a little one in the video that I was I was making them kiss. I I just find them adorable. Oh, okay. And there it is, yeah. yeah. So it's been very fun for me over the last couple of months because we've had a lot of programs on marine biology. We've had fisheries and ocean scientists. And we keep getting the question, like, what's your favorite? What's the cutest fish? Everyone loves lump suckers. Like this is a creature that like, as a biologist by background, I'd like vaguely heard about. Now in the last few months, like lump suckers get brought up in every marine program. So it's uh, appreciated every time we get this. There a lot yeah. of fun. Um, by the way, there were, I, I will say, even as a lifelong animal lover, there were some creatures in that thing that you shared that were absolutely not cute, but I'm glad that you think so. That's that's why you get to do this and go out there. There's like the sucker exactly. face, like tube monster thing. It looked like a, a trumped up tardigrade sort of thing. Terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I think there was a creature like that in King Kong with eight Andy Circus. Anyway, Miss Tarvin's class, we're going to head to you guys next. Come back in and get and take us away. Hey. What's the biggest fish you've ever caught? Ooh, biggest. Very good question. Um, I think the biggest fish is probably a Greenland shark, uh, somewhere around just under two meters. So, um, so just, just over six feet tall. Yeah. Somewhere in there. Cool. Uh, they get quite a bit bigger than that, if I'm not mistaken. Green oh, absolutely. Yeah. I think they can swim faster than our nets, though. So. <laughs> bigger nets, faster ships. Next time. Yeah. Um, I'm going to head to one more live class, take a couple from YouTube, and we'll wrap from there because time flies in your head and fun, Sheila. Um, but New Brunswick, if you guys want to come on back in, you're good to go. Riverside. Hey, guys. Hi. You have a question for us? Come on up. <laughs> How long have you been doing this? Yes. The question. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that I've been on ships for 11 years. Um, and uh, I've been a field biologist for somewhere around 18 years. Yep. <laughs> you don't need to say it like that. 18 is fantastic. 11 on ships. No, I, I just, I really, I'd have to count. So I'm, I'm going to throw out 18. One, two. My with yeah. a margin of error, yeah. It's, you know, what I always like to highlight the students is that it's quite a bit of schooling to end up in a position where you get a job like yours. It's like daunting for a grade five to hear, but you get to end up where you're like buzzing a ship in a cool plane and catching Greenland sharks. And it's like Christmas every day with your shared bathroom on the super ships. And there you go. Um, Sheila, I'm going to take a few quick ones from YouTube before we wrap up. I love this question from Charlie uh, in Miss Pickens' class, grade eight air and remote. Do you, have you ever caught wildlife you didn't intend to catch? By catch. And what do you do with it? Do you have an opportunity to safely release them or not in the research that you're doing? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, part of our surveying is that everything that comes up, we, we uh, identify it and weigh it and count it. So there's nothing that we don't want to catch. But there are species listed in the Species at Risk Act, the SARA Act, um, that are wolf fish. And uh, we want to release those alive as quickly as possible because their populations have been deemed to be really low and so they're they're um endangered is not the word but they're but they're being uh monitored um so we when we catch a wolf fish we have a whole protocol around get the wolf fish weigh the wolf fish get the wolf fish off the boat as fast as possible interesting you actually followed up beautifully with the last question i was going to ask which is about endangered species being caught by mixed box holes class so that's perfect sheila is there I, I mean, you've had the chance to showcase so many cool adventures today, so many amazing species that you're pulling up from this really unique ecosystem. Is there a final message you want to share with our classes today? Anything that you can encourage them to keep the learning going when they're they're done this broadcast with us? Yeah, I, I, I think my biggest message would just be to, like, take the opportunities you can and always, like, be safe in what you do. Don't don't take risks, but definitely seek out opportunities, take opportunities 
And all of the skills that you build from those opportunities, even they're, even if they're not directly what you want to do, they will build towards the thing that you want to end up doing. So uh, no experience will go to waste. Sheila, this is a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much for joining us as a sort of capstone of our Fisheries Notion series and uh, just an extraordinary talk in its own right. What we do to end every broadcast, I'm going to bring in all our teachers to say a big thank you and farewell. So Ms. Gallon's class, Ms. Cottrell, Ms. Tarvin, our New Brunswick Riverside Consolidated folks, if you guys want to unmute your mics, you are all in the broadcast. Yeah. 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 Yeah.